Kathleen Dowdy is a producer and director, uh, an award-winning Los Angeles filmmaker whose work includes long and short form documentaries, a narrative feature, nonfiction series, specials, talk show, television, and multimedia, which means she's an independent producer and does whatever she possibly can to be able to be a <laughs> filmmaker. Um, and she shot this over 20 years, starting with a uh, interview she conducted with Congressman Lewis in the 90s and has 95 hours of tape with him. Uh, Nelson Linder, to my left, is the president of the Austin chapter of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, in Austin. <laughs> and Dr. Tasha Philot is an associate professor of government at UT and a scholar of African American congressional history. Um, so let me start, Kathleen. Tell us about the process of making this film and uh, the 20 year journey. So yeah, I, I don't know if I'm, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. So I met Congressman Lewis uh, when he was just running actually for Congress in the late 80s and I was uh, doing a, another documentary and interviewed him for that documentary. And I did not know very much about him. And so he got into the interview, we asked him a few questions about the other subject and then just on a kind of whim, we said, well, you know what, you tell us a little bit about your story. And he started telling those stories, which if you can imagine hearing them for the first time, maybe it is the first time for some of you, he's just spellbinding. Um, his delivery, the, the way the stories are told, and of course the subject of the story, um, of each of those stories is just, um, I'd never heard anything like it. And uh, so after that interview, we asked him if we could make a film about him, and he was, he agreed. So we began a very long process. Um, we shot quite a bit of the film in the early 90s. You probably could tell the younger interview, <laughs> younger interviews are from them. The family reunion is, is in that um, period. But uh, it took a while to get uh, the momentum that we needed. Uh, the connections, the money, the partnerships. Uh, and it really took off again after um, President Obama was elected. And people were curious about the movement. And Lewis began to get a lot of national attention. And so uh, we went back to Washington, showed him some of the early footage, and he said, finish it. So <laughs> we followed orders. Uh, Dr. Phil Ott, what, what's what is... Um uh, Congressman Lewis's um, position in Congress. I've always thought of him as sort of a moral compass. Um, uh, he's regarded as one of the most liberal, consistently liberal uh, congressmen in Congress. So. And has he been, uh, in terms of his legacy and in terms of his place in Congress, um, how would you define his, his importance you know, in, his, in his years being a congressman? I mean, he's certainly consistent uh, in terms of his uh, persistence in fighting for um, civil rights, anti-discrimination across a multitude of groups. Um, his legacy continues uh, in terms of making sure that the African American um, History Museum was built. That was part of uh, uh, his legacy, introducing the bill. And he fought for that for decades, literally decades. Um, year after year until it was passed by Congress. Kathleen, what do you hope um, uh, for this film in terms of not only just the success as a film, you know, but we're living in a time right now where a lot of the things that uh, Congressman Lewis fought for his entire life have come under attack? It's been very interesting to show the film since the election. Um, we had a period, and we started showing it about a year ago, and initially, it was a good response, but it was nothing like um, the response we've gotten since, since November. And I think that uh, over and over again, what I hear people saying from the audience is, we need inspiration. We need a vision. And this is a story and a man who really imparts that um, powerfully. And it's very uh, encouraging after screening when I hear a lot of people stand up and say, okay, I'm ready, what can I do? I want to do something, where do I go? Who do I talk to? How do I sign up? And that is by far 
something I know is music to your ears, Mr. Linder. Um, definitely what we would hope for in the film, for sure. Mr. Linder, you're here at ground zero for a lot of the issues that, uh, that John was talking about. Well, I was born on ground zero in, in, in Macon, Georgia in 1958, so when I see John Lewis, I see my own ancestors because, frankly, that was a culture of the South. It was a culture based on sacrifice, based on, on discipline, based on courage. He came out of that. And frankly, at the young age of 58, that, that reality is still relevant today. I grew up in that kind of environment. And I think what's important is, is that the integrity, um, the commitment, and the willingness to lose one's life for a greater cause. I mean, it was those kind of... Um, actions that, that inspired everybody. And, and I think my, my disappointment is that those are all valuable lessons in terms of acts of courage and sacrifices, but somehow in the process, as a people, I have to, have to say this, despite his sacrifice, the nation, unfortunately, didn't remember all those lessons. And as a result, as he said, the pendulum swings back and forth. We lost some things. So I think more so than just the applause we see for what he did, it's also the understanding and for us to to make our own commitment to what he stood for, because without that, these things are not permanent. So if you lose your focus and your commitment and your courage, guess what? It can swing back and forth. So to me, he was just a testament in courage and sacrifice and also steadfastness. How did your feeling about uh, Kathleen making the film change over time? I mean, obviously the politics change over time. Uh, you know, it's really interesting to see, let's say, C.T. Vivian in two different types of his, portions of his life he ages on camera. Uh -huh. I think he starts out young and he gets older. Mm -hmm. Uh, and some of the people are the opposite way, depending on where you're using it. But you're, you know, you're filming all these heroes of the civil rights movement, Bernard Lafayette, uh, James Lawson, uh, Andy Young. It's amazing to see the old footage of Diane Nash, you know, walking with, with, uh, with Congressman Lewis as 20-year-olds mm -hmm. over in Nashville. Mm -hmm. and what, how did that affect you in terms of the process of making this? Well, it's, uh, for any filmmaker, it's frustrating um, to have to wait that long to see a film made. Um, 20 years, it's like, when are you going to be done? My family was just like, give it up, just do it. And um, I think, though, that one of the things that was surprisingly beneficial about all of that is the very fact that you see, especially Congressman Lewis, aging on camera, and you see him becoming, um, starting as a very young activist, becoming more and more skilled, I would say, through the film at communicating and at conveying these passions that he had, um, especially some of the footage of him, and the C-SPAN footage on the floor of the house where he talks about, he almost is scolding other members of Congress. I think they call him in Congress the conscience of Congress because he can get away with doing that. I mean, he can, I guess it's what you call shame. I mean, he can, he can really make people feel like being, uh, casting a vote in a certain way is um, greedy or is a sign of self-interest. Nobody else, I think, in, in Congress could, can do that. It's, it's phenomenal. Um, so yeah, I see him um, gaining uh, a sense of his, his power, really, in that, in that role. And that was, that was important to see, for sure. We've got about 10, 10 minutes or so for questions, and I'm assuming that people have some questions out there for the filmmaker and for our panelists. What are you doing to disseminate this to young people? It's one thing for us to sit in the room and enjoy your film, which is very educational. But I think that young people coming up need to see that they have the power to change. Yes. So uh, we premiered the film about two weeks on public television. And as part of that, um, we become part of a um, website called uh, PBS Learning Media, which is specifically for K through 12 um, students. And we supply them with a discussion guide, curriculum modules, clips from the film, um, and a, a lot of sort of resource material not so much to show the whole film in class, but to really kind of take it apart. And this film really breaks down nicely. There are chapters of all, for all of these stories. Uh, but it also gives teachers the tools to think about way they can, the ways they can present it. Um, it can be one class. It can be a whole series of classes. But we've always felt um, from the first days of shooting it that 
the true audience is the audience that the congressman um, wants for the film, which is the next generations. Um, and so, yes? Could you please talk about what Congressman Lewis has done through, through faith and politics in trying to educate the members of Congress and their families and, and uh, anybody else lucky enough to get mm -hmm. to go on one of those? Mm -hmm. Because I think his role as a teacher yeah. has been greatly uh, underappreciated. Yes. By the yes. And he, he has been the nation's conscience, but he's also been the nation's teacher. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So there's an organization in Washington called the Faith and Politics Institute. And every year, just about now, it's the week of uh, Bloody Sunday, which is the weekend of is the 7th, 6th, 7th, and 8th of, of March. Um, the congressman takes a group of usually between 25 and 30 members of Congress, mostly members of the House, but also senators, on a pilgrimage through the sites of the civil rights movement. So they all fly to Birmingham and at, then go to Montgomery and then to Selma. And they stop at all the churches and the sites of these events and not only Congressman Lewis, but Bernard Lafayette, some of the other member, member move, uh, members of the uh, SNCC are there. Local people are there who were part of these events. And they testify, basically, to what happened to these churches, church full of, of uh, members of Congress. It's very, very powerful. You've seen a lot of footage from one of those pilgrimages in the film. We were lucky enough to go along and, and shoot these. But I think that um, you're right. His role leading that pilgrimage is one of the magnets for these members of Congress to go, to actually see him talk about these incidents that he lived through and went through in a sort of immediate present tense at the locations that they, they happened. Um, we interviewed a lot of the members of Congress who were on those pilgrimages. And it was just consistent from all of them how moved they were and how they never knew that this was. They, they'd heard his stories, but they'd never s sort of connected the dots with these places and people. So it's a very, very powerful, if you're ever invited, don't even hesitate. It's a great, great opportunity. And you feel like you've gone to the mountaintop. Yes. You feel like you can say, oh, I was there. Yeah. I was taught yeah. by a man who's not going to pass, no one like him is going to pass this way again. That's right. You know you're in the, you're in the arena of greatness, mm -hmm. and everybody feels it. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. You saw in the scene where he's walking across the bridge with, um, I think he's with um, a couple of members of Congress, and he's pointing out, like, here's where the horse is. That was, that was the pilgrimage. So you actually walk across the Edmund Pettus Bridge with him. And he's just in the moment. I mean, he's there. It's like 50 years has not passed at all. Yeah, it's very, very yeah. powerful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes? Yeah. Just uh, curious. Uh, I know he was uh, present uh, many times at the White House with President Johnson in the run of the Voting Rights Act. That's right. Yeah. And I'm just curious. Obviously, it's such a full life. And you have to edit certain parts of it. What did the congressman have to say about that relationship? Well, I think that uh, at the time, when the Bloody Sunday happened, uh, the congressman was 24 years old. And I think that um, at that time, the way I understood the story is that it was principally Dr. King and, and President Johnson. I don't know. I've, I don't have the inside story on it. But um, I know that Lewis. Um, was certainly considered part of the leadership from the student wing of, um, of the movement. But I'm not sure how much negotiating went on at that time with directly with the president. Um, and actually, and Johnson had already written up the Voting Rights Act before Selma. And they were waiting. And he had told King that um, he needed something on the ground. And um, they, were, they were waiting for something to happen. Yeah. Oh, sure. Do. Uh, I'm Lucy Johnson, and we had in our family something called Daddy Duty, 
And, and daddy duty meant that you would accompany uh, the president uh, whenever he was going to a significant, the signing of a significant piece of legislation or making a significant speech. And um, July the 2nd, 1964, when the 1964 Civil Rights Act, otherwise known as a public accommodation, was passed, it was my 17th birthday. And nobody on the face of the earth is ever gonna get a, such a great birthday present as that. <laughs> it, was, it was all so very personal. And then August the 6th, uh, 1965, I was again on, on daddy duty, and uh, my father asked me to join him in the diplomatic reception room, which is a room that's right off of the South Portico when uh, uh, heads of state are coming in and, and, and into the White House and the ceremonies are out on the lawn. And that didn't make any sense because big legislation like this would be signed in the East Room of the, of the White House. And, and, and quite candidly, although I was thrilled to death to do this, I was 18 years old and I had places to go and things to do. And, 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 and so the East Room was really convenient and I didn't understand why we were going down to the diplomatic reception room. And uh, my father first the teacher, always a teacher, very much like Congressman Lewis, when I asked him, why on earth are we coming down to the diplomatic reception room, he said, well, because Lucy Baines, which meant, of course, I was in trouble, always the double name meant you're in trouble. Uh, some of you who are daughters of the South uh, are laughing too because they've been in that same situation. And he said, we are going to the Congress to sign this legislation. And I said, Daddy, why are we going up to the Congress? obviously knowing that this is going to take a lot longer than what I had scheduled uh, and <laughs> in my mind. And he said, because Lucy Baines, many courageous men and women, because of their vote on this bill, will not be returning to the Congress. That's why we're going to the Congress. Mm -hmm. They deserve for us to go up there on their turf and tell the world how courageous they were and how proud we are of them and how indebted we are to them. And many great men and women will be coming to the Congress who never could have come otherwise. And I believe with all that's in me that he was thinking of someone like John Lewis because of the passage of the Voting Rights Act, which John Lewis fought so fervently for, he was able to become one of the most effective members of the Congress of the United States and be, as you so eloquently spoke earlier, the conscience of the Congress. Yes, please. I want to make a point, because I can't get lost in the shuffle. We see Congressman Lewis as a zenith in the White House as a politician, we can't forget talking to young people where it came from. It came out of our communities. At that time, he was not famous. He was risking his life. He was spit upon, beat, blooded. We have to be careful to remember that these guys came out of our communities like everyday people. To our young folks, you too can be great today. I think there are great people being born every minute. The, 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 the challenge is, how do you define your struggle? Where is your integrity? Where is your discipline? Because the issues in many ways, are even greater today with all our challenges. So I think, look at where you started from, the South. I was born in the South. The conditions are right right now for Black Lives Matter and other groups. Look at where you are. Show some integrity. Be unselfish. Work for a greater cause other than yourself. So I think the lesson is, is that these guys came out of our normal community with normal people, but because of sacrifice and because of courage, they became great. So while we applaud where they are, we also embrace and applaud where they started like all of us. And the wonder of it all is he has never forgotten for one moment where he started. And that's the reason why he does uh, these marvelous trips 
over and over again to try to, to teach others that uh, they too need to be able to stand up and be counted because the fight is not won. I see a question back over there. Bringing this to current events, what's it going to take to uh, impact change now since um, the Republicans are in the majority in House and Senate and in Texas? And so I've been writing to my uh, senators and to my congressperson. And I, I feel like that's useless because uh, I get the same. If I get a response, it's very much not what my belief system is. So what is it going to take? Um, is it going to take more marches with pink hats? Or just what is it going to take? And where are the leaders? Where's the bench? Uh, where are the up and coming people uh, for midterm elections and beyond? Is that to me? <laughs> <laughs> Who else? <laughs> well, you know, let's be let's be brutally brutally honest. It's not just Republicans. Democrats made a lot of mistakes. Yeah. We, we we bear responsibility because you know what? If our kids are apathetic and not involved, who are we gonna blame? Us. We take too much for granted. So I would say it's upon us as as older people. To, to go to work and teach our young people about these kind of films, about these kind of heroes who are right here in our community today who did the same thing. We have Joe Lewis in Austin, Texas. But if we don't teach our young people and they don't listen, it's gonna happen again. So I would say, rather than looking at the symptoms, let's address the origin of the problem, which is apathy, lack of understanding, we're too selfish as a society, and we're too distracted. So let's back up a little bit and teach young people about what it means to be involved in your community, by what it means to read the newspaper, not just social media, what it means to write an article, what it means to know your neighbor and your zip codes. So I think we've got to reverse this whole stack about doing the little things that make us human beings. We, we are human beings, we can't ever forget that because of technology. We've got to back up, assess ourselves, take a lot of responsibility, quit blaming other people, and realize what we didn't do right that put us in this predicament. I'm talking about Democrats. You got to stand tall, stand strong, and make sure that every part of this nation is properly represented. And we didn't do that. As a result, now we've been set back, what, 30, 40 years? Lessons learned. Lessons learned. I also say this. We're, we're in a time when things like truth and justice are partisan. And we, we need to take a step back and realize that, that no one party owns that. Um, and so we have to convince people that fighting for equality isn't a democratic capital D Democratic, it's a little d Democratic. So we can't be a democracy and have large groups of people marginalized. So we need to convince people that it's in all of our best interests, not the Republicans, not the Democrats, to fight for this. The other thing in terms of politics is we're worried about 2020 because that's a presidential election. We need to be worried about 2020 because that's when our state legislatures and the census are coming up. That's where real change is going to happen. We need to make sure that we take back those state legislatures so that when we're drawing these districts, I'm not voting with the people in Waco and College Station. And they're drawing these districts in fair and equitable ways. Right? So you know, I can call Ted Cruz, and he's not going to call me back. And I can't do anything about that. But let's worry about making impact on these low turnout elections, these state legislators who are now going to be redrawing these districts come 2020. How can yeah. people act on that, though? How can people, what can people do to make that happen? I think people don't realize how important those local elections are. I think, you know, we spend billions, literally billions of dollars on presidential elections, and people think that's the most important thing. And people don't realize that the drawing of these congressional elections happens on our state level. We don't, you know, that big pink building up the street is where a lot of action happens, and we just ignore it. And so we really do need to, to uh, disseminate information about what happens in our local and state politics and that we need to be paying as much attention to those folks as we do um, with Congress and, and the presidency. And also, I mean, there are three branches of government. It's not just the presidency. We've got midterms next year. 
We're focused on local elections. We can change a lot of things. So I think the idea that there, there are checks and balances, and the Republicans know this, the Tea Party found this out. You know, if you focus on your local elections and your state houses, if you control the House and the Senate, you can block a lot of things. So we can't just look at the, the highest level of the president. We can think about the whole entire constitution, the whole government. And, and it's very hard to make folks think about state politics or, or local politics in the midst of all these changes. So I think that's part of our challenge. Let's go back to making it basic. Vote locally, act locally, and understand that there are checks and balances out there for us to use if we understand how the political system functions. And too often, we get lost in the, in the context. One of the challenges um, is that voter turnout in Texas is pathetic. It's the lowest in the country, and it's hard to be able to uh, affect political change if you don't vote. And one of, the, um, one of the great things that films like this can do is to remind people about history and remind people about how change actually has happened in the past and the importance of it. We have to wrap up, but I want to uh, leave the last word for Kathleen because uh, um, as a fellow documentary filmmaker, you don't always get to have an audience. <laughs> <laughs> so how would you finish up in terms of how you feel about this 20-year journey and just, uh, and just well, about your Well, actually, I'd film? like to just follow up on what you've said, because um, last uh, October, we showed the film at a high school just outside of Houston. And uh, as a result of the screening of the film, every eligible senior in that school registered to vote. Yeah. High school. In high school, and I think that's that is where we we really want to go is to young people and to get them in the habit. Mm -hmm. If you register to vote after you see this film, you're not going to forget it. You know, next next four years later, you're going to be out there voting again. Two years later, the next the next and the next elections. And I just feel like um, although these are all things we need to do, we also need to motivate people to do them. And what does that take? Um, the filmmaker is going to be here to be able to answer your questions individually along with our panelists. But let's give a hand for everybody tonight. For this. <laughs>